EOS is the Entrepreneurial Operating System. It's a proven system of simple, practical tools that um, entrepreneurs use to help them get what they want from their businesses. And so implementers, what we do is we work with leadership teams inside uh, small businesses uh, to help them get clear on their vision, uh, to get everybody understanding where the company is going and what the plan is to get there, um, to achieve traction so that they have more focus and discipline and accountability uh, in the company, and then to function as a more healthy and cohesive leadership team. So we work with leadership teams to help them kind of get up and running on the system, and then over time, they roll that system out uh, to the rest of the company so that ultimately the whole company is clear on the vision, is you know, more focused and disciplined and accountable, and is functioning as a more healthy team. So you're a smart business committed to innovation, to service and to modern marketing. And you're asking, what's next? Wondering how you can become even more innovative. My name is Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz and this is the InnovaBuzz podcast where we share all kinds of tips, advice and interview guests on all things innovation and leadership in modern marketing. Hi innovators. It's great to be back again. I hope your week so far has been awesome. I'm really excited today to have on the Innova Buzz podcast as my guest, Marissa Smith, who's a speaker, an entrepreneur, and a professional EOS implementer. That's EOS for the Entrepreneurial Operating System, which is based on the book Traction by Gino Wickman. Marissa and I talked about the foundation tools of the EOS system, the benefits to bringing structure to your business like the EOS system does, and how to delegate and elevate. Without further ado then, let's fly into the hive and get the buzz from Marissa Smith. Hi, I'm your host Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz and I'm really excited to welcome to the InnovaBuzz podcast today all the way from the greater Detroit area in the USA, Marissa Smith, who's a speaker, an entrepreneur, and a professional EOS implementer. So that's the Entrepreneurial Operating System, as outlined in the book Traction by Gino Wakeman. She's also the founder of the Whole Brain Group um, that develop and execute digital marketing plans for um, businesses to complement their strategic vision and provide measurable results. So welcome to the podcast, Marissa. It's great to have you here. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Now, Anise Kavanagh, who was on episode 121, introduced me to Marissa and suggested we interview you on the podcast. So a big hello to Anise. We love Anise. <laughs> <laughs> now, before we get on to marketing and entrepreneurship and systems, let's find out a little bit more about your background. So as a young child, what did you want to do when you grew up? <laughs> so I always loved playing office. I don't think I had a specific, <laughs> I didn't have a specific, uh, you know, I want to be a, uh, a lawyer or anything like that, but I always loved office supplies and I would spend most of my allowance at the stationery store in my hometown, um, you know, buying stamps and th- that was office related. So I had a my, in my parents' basement, I had a whole uh, corporation, fantasy corporation that I would run uh, with a best friend. And, um, you know, we, we ran a, a clothing company, uh, an imaginary clothing company, but I always did love to, to do that. So it didn't surprise my parents completely that I ended up as an entrepreneur and business owner. Yeah, so you were practicing very early for that. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So where did the journey lead you from there? <laughs> Well, uh, like all kids who want to be business owners, I became a music major, uh, <laughs> and <laughs> no, so I went to college for voice performance, actually, and was a mm. music major, uh, but in there, I realized I really didn't want to do music full-time, and so um, I had gotten involved in athletics while I was at college. I managed the football team. I did all the equipment for the football team while I was there, and also did some academic advising. Um, of the athletes. And so I decided that I wanted to go to graduate school for academic advising of athletes. 
uh, which I did. I came to University of Michigan and got my master's degree. Um, and then I got a job as an academic advisor and discovered that I didn't actually like working with students very much. Um, and so uh, I ended up teaching myself database development and uh, website programming and built the first website for that academic advising office uh, as a way of getting out of talking to people on a daily basis. Uh, <laughs> That, of course, led me to doing technical support, which led me to doing um, some larger projects. And eventually, I decided I wanted to strike out on my own and, and uh, create my own business doing software development. Uh, so I did that for a number of years. And then um, when the economy tanked here in the U.S. in 2008, we pivoted to become a, a website development marketing company. And um, that's the whole brain group that I still own today. Uh, and then over time there, I actually got interested in EOS and decided to become an EOS implementer. So, hmm. it's a okay, no, well, that's that's quite a, the circuitous, yeah. quite the circuitous path, path there. It makes sense looking back on it, but it didn't make a hmm. lot of sense forward. So, all right, and um, now I believe you're no longer involved in the day-to-day -day running of the whole brain company. Correct. Right. Yeah. So about. About four years ago, um, you know, we had kind of hit the ceiling as a company and as a, you know, personally for me, I just wasn't really enjoying myself anymore. And a friend of mine recommended that I um, read the book Traction by Gino Wickman. And I did. And I immediately was like, oh my gosh, why hadn't I found this earlier? Hmm. Uh, so we, we implemented EOS in my marketing business. And um, that led me to get out of the day-to-day. -day. I, I turned the day-to-day -day over to my leadership team a couple of years ago, and now they run um, the day-to-day -day of the, the business, and I'm able to do what I love doing, which is helping other people run their businesses on EOS. So, hmm. Okay. So yeah. ex explain to uh, everyone then what exactly it is you, that you do now and why. Sure. So I'm not sure how familiar your listeners are uh, uh, with EOS, but EOS is the Entrepreneurial Operating System. It's a proven system of simple, practical tools that um, entrepreneurs use to help them get what they want from their businesses. And so implementers, what we do is we work with leadership teams inside uh, small businesses uh, to help them get clear on their vision, uh, to get everybody understanding where the company is going and what the plan is to get there. Um, to achieve traction so that they have more focus and discipline and accountability uh, in the company, and then to function as a more healthy and cohesive leadership team. So we work with leadership teams to help them kind of get up and running on the system, and then over time, they roll that system out uh, to the rest of the company so that ultimately the whole company is clear on the vision, is you know, more focused and disciplined and accountable, and is functioning as a more healthy team. So. That's what I do on a daily basis. So work with a lot of teams of, you know, 10 to 250 employees typically in a variety of industries, uh, manufacturing, health care, IT, um, professional services. And, you know, primarily what I do is I just teach them the system. I facilitate their sessions so that they have a objective person in the room with them, helping them, you know, uncover the answers that they um, that are in the room. And then I um, coach them, you know, to become their best as a leadership team. Mm, yeah, that that's, sounds really exciting. And I'm sure there's a huge demand for that. Now, just by way of reminder, so the book that um, outlines the whole entrepreneurial operating system or EOS is the book called Traction by Gino yes. Wickman. And I definitely mm -hmm. recommend people read that because it is quite a... Um, quite a, an insightful outline of how to structure a business in a way that everybody's aligned with the vision values and and then breaks down goals into 10, 3, and 1 year and so on. Um, I, um, one of the things that strikes me from the book um, that in a small business, um, it's probably a lot easier to implement something like that um, than it would be in a larger business. And you talked about, um, you know, companies of up to 200, uh, mm -hmm. what are some of the unique challenges there to get to implement uh, EOS in, in that sort of company? Yeah, so in the larger companies, you know, it can be a little bit more challenging just because there's more people to get on board with the, with the, the process and the system. Um, and so typically it just is adding more time and um, uh, 
you know, the timeline for implementing all of the tools tends to extend. Um, but still, even in my larger companies, it's generally between, you know, two to three years before they really get it all rolled out to the whole company. You know, ultimately, it's up to my clients to choose what pace they want to operate at. So there's nothing mm. saying, like, you have to have it rolled out by, you know, a certain date. Uh, but in general, it's, you know, one to three years. Um, you know, typically the average is around two, but in the larger companies, it can take a little longer. Um, the good thing is that now we have five books. So in addition to Traction, uh, we have the book Get a Grip, which is more of a, um, a fable. So it's more of a story of how a company implements EOS. Um, there's a book called Rocket Fuel, which is all about the visionary and the integrator relationship. So the two people who are kind of at the helm of the organization and how that relationship works. Um, there's uh, How to Be a Great Boss, which is for the leaders and the managers inside the company. And then there's What the Heck is EOS, which is for everybody else in the company. So when you go to roll it out, you have books for every type of person in the company to help them understand you know, what EOS is and how it can help them in that particular role in the company. And so that really does help with buy-in and just educating people on what it is um, in a more efficient way. Mm. Okay, so, that's great. Yeah. yeah. So we'll have mm -hmm. to link to all of those books. Are all of those books available? I've seen Get a Grip and Rocket Fuel. Um, they are. Yep, they're all available through um, Amazon and you know on the website um, mm. under the Traction Library. And there's you know bulk discounts and all kinds of good stuff available there. But yep, they are all out and available now. Great. I have to add those to my reading list then. <laughs> Your summer reading list. Yeah, that's um, right. Oh, that's right. It's not it's, summer there. It's, it's winter here, but I'm I'm about to head to the summer. So that's right, right, right. Yeah. All right. So what what kind of things then do you work on in implementing EOS in a company? Then talk us through a little bit the system and, and how it all works together and how you impl implement that. Sure. So, you know, there's a number of tools um, that we teach uh, to help people, you know, get everything implemented in the company. There's five foundational tools that we focus on. So there's something called the Vision Traction Organizer, which is a two-page business plan that really boils everything uh, down into the answers to eight key questions. So if we can get the leadership team on the same page with the answers to all of those questions, um, then that helps them crystallize their vision so that they can then, you know, get themselves on the same page, get the rest of the company on the same page and get everybody rowing in the same direction. So that's a key tool that we, um, we work through a process of facilitating the leadership team to get in agreement on what the answers to those questions are and then get it documented on this vision traction organizer. Um, we also help them crystallize what the right company structure is for their company. So we build something we call an accountability chart um, that just gets really clear what the right structure is and then what the roles and responsibilities are for each of the key roles in the, or seats in the company. Um, and that just really helps people get clear on who's accountable for what uh, so that when it comes to decision making or resolving issues, um, there's not that, you know, who's on first uh, type of situation that can mm -hmm. happen in some yeah. smaller companies, you know. Yeah. Um, we also help them run great world-class meetings. We teach something called a level 10 meeting agenda uh, that helps people really manage their time wisely and work um, as a leadership team to keep that pulse, you know, going in the business, the heartbeat of the, um, the business so that everybody's making progress on their priorities, that they're keeping an eye on their numbers, that they're getting their to-dos done, that they're resolving issues. Um, those are really important. So that's a key discipline that we teach. Um, and then we also work to help them identify what their priorities are on a quarterly basis. So, you know, there's 136 issues going on at any given time in a company. And, you know, you have to really just focus on a handful of issues and, you know, discover or decide what your priorities are so you can focus on solving them and then move on to the next set of issues. Uh, so we call those rocks, those three to seven priorities that you're going to be laser focused on for the quarter. Um, and then finally, we have a scorecard as well that we help um, really define what the key numbers are that you need to be looking at week after week after week so that you have a pulse on your business and you know whether or not you're off track, you know, before um, it's an emergency, right? So you can do something about it. Mm -hmm. um, 
before it becomes a huge problem. And so many times people are reacting, you know, they get their quarter end financials and go, oh no, we should have done something 90 days ago, you know. Yeah. Um, so having that scorecard where you're looking at you know, those key numbers week after week after week is another discipline. So those are the five key tools that we, we focus on in the beginning is that vision traction organizer, accountability chart, the rocks, the meeting pulse, and the scorecard. Um, and then from there, once they master those, then we're working on a number of other tools that we use to help them really, you know, get the right people in the right seats, manage, you know, based on numbers, get their core processes documented, you know, all the fundamental things that you really need to have in place so that you can be freed up to focus on, you know, other more important and interesting things. Mm, that's right. And, yeah. and what I, I mean, there's a couple of things I like, really like about the, um, EOS system and it's it's just gives that clarity of structure but all based on starting with the vision and the values of the company um, and then the focus and the the leading indicators is the uh, another right. one that you know comes out of there like, as you mm -hmm. said it's not oh we should have done this three months ago it's kind of like hang on this needs course correction right now, and if we course correct right now, then everything's good. Exactly, right. Mm. So we're trying to get people to shift from being consumed by working in the business all the time to getting their heads out of the, the, <laughs> the trees and just looking out and being better at predicting at what's coming at them so that they can plan for it and predict what's coming instead of constantly reacting. Um, you know, so on a day-to-day -day basis, most people don't take, they just don't think to take the time to do that as a team. Um, and so really that's built in to EOS is taking these full days uh, together, getting in a room off-site somewhere to really just focus on the business and get everybody back on the same page so that then walking out of the room, their energy is all focused, you know, going in the same direction. Um, so it's really just a great way to manage the human energy in your company. So... And I, um, from what I can gather, you discovered EOS by uh, or the power of EOS when you implemented it in your own business. And I did, and that was what kind of drove you to take it on board and share that experience with others. So, what what was your own experience, and, and you know, what were some of the results you had, and how quickly did you see a turnaround of the company? Right. So for me, the biggest thing was that the company that I had built, I accidentally built it to be completely dependent on me. <laughs> um, and one day I woke which up most and I was like, gosh, which you know, most why? entrepreneurs do. <laughs> right. I just, it, I wasn't intentional about it, quite honestly. Mm, it was just yeah. kind of doing what, what I could to, to um, survive, you know, in many ways. And you just kind of, you know, take what comes at you and then one day you wake up and you go, oh my gosh, how did I get all these people depending on me and why do all these clients only want to talk to me and, you mm. know, why are we only doing things that just I am capable of delivering on? Um, and so once I had that realization, I really realized that my business wasn't scalable. It was too dependent on me and if I was ever going to get out of <laughs> the day-to-day, -day, I had to uh, changed the way the company was structured, changed the, what we were delivering, honestly, what services we were delivering, um, and really just look at it more from a, um objective viewpoint instead of as my, you know, my baby mm, <laughs> in many mm. ways. Um, and so EOS really helped me do that. You know, it was, it came at a good time. I had had a couple of kids and I was just at that point of like, gosh, I want to see them at some point, you know. Um, <laughs> you know, I started this business to have more flexibility and freedom and I don't have any more flexibility and freedom. Uh, in fact, I have less. And so, um, you know, I implemented EOS, you know, the most powerful thing for me, at least initially, was just that accountability chart and realizing that I had other people on the team who wanted to help and I really was, was bad at letting go and at delegating to other people. And so um, getting clear on who was going to do what and what I could let go of. And then um, just having that structure in place really gave me some peace of mind. And then once I got a taste of letting go, I wanted to get, let go of everything, quite <laughs> honestly. So I was like, oh, this is great. You know, I can have other people do stuff. Um, and so, you know, that level 10 meetings, you know, and just we had to do a complete pivot 
when the economy tanked in 2008. And if I had, if I had the viewpoint that I had to get that all done all at once, I would have just quit. Um, but having the power of the rock, and just focusing on a few things at a time, getting those done and then moving on to the next set of things just helped me, um, you know, qu kind of quiet the noise <laughs> um, and, you know, gain traction. And, you know, 18 months later, we had completely turned over every single client in our business. We were doing a completely different, you know, delivering a completely different set of services. Um, and it just kind of happened. You, know, you had to t take tiny bites of the elephant and, you know, you w wake up a year and a half later and, and you've eaten the whole thing. Mm. Um, so really for me, just having that structure gave me that peace of mind um, so that I didn't have to figure that out for myself. It was already, I knew it worked already. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. yeah, that's, that's a really powerful, powerful um, example of how EOS can transform a business. Now, I'm fascinated because, you know, and, and I suspect that this is a problem in all entrepreneurial businesses where the founder is still hands-on in the business, and that's the, the delegating and the letting go. And how, mm -hmm. how did you kind of address the mindset thing there? Because, you know, letting go is such a hard thing to do. And if, uh, I think that unless people change their mindset around that, it's, it's going to be virtually hindered right from the outset. Right. right. You know, for me, the biggest thing, honestly, was letting go of my ego. Um, <laughs> you know, as a, as a woman, as a consultant, as somebody who was looked to to have all of the answers, um, it was really hard to control that urge to know everything all, the, all of the time. Um, and so I, you know, I had trouble delegating because I didn't want to kind of admit that I needed help, right? Um, or I didn't want to look weak or like I didn't know the answer. And so I just kind of hoarded, <laughs> hoarded that information and then resented everybody for needing the information from me. So it was kind <laughs> of an, un, it was an unhealthy uh, <laughs> attitude. Um, but, you know, honestly, once I, I just kind of hit the wall and I realized that if I didn't change, um, I was going to explode, you know, or, or break. And so I just had to start um, letting go of things. And, you know, the biggest thing for me was, was finding out that there were people who liked doing the things that I didn't like doing but was good at. Hmm. So there were a lot of things that I was good at that I kept doing because I thought that nobody else would want to do those things, um, and I didn't like doing them, so they kind of suck the energy out of me. Um, but I felt bad asking other people to do them because how can you ask somebody to do something that you hate doing, right? That, that feels yeah, yeah. like a terrible thing. Um, and once I read the book Rocket Fuel, which is that book about the visionary and integrator relationship, it, it shed light on the fact that there are people who actually like to manage people. There are people who like to repeat themselves and make other people follow processes. And those were all things that I hated, but mm. thought that I had to do. I thought that as the owner and as the entrepreneur, that just was something I was going to have to always do. Um, and so reading that book really opened my eyes that, oh my gosh, there are people who like integrating that, you know, like running the day-to-day -day of the company, if I can find one of those, you know, that's utopia for me. Mm. Um, and so luckily I looked inside the organization and found out there was somebody sitting right next to me who liked all of those things. I just never had occurred to me to ask him, um, <laughs> if he liked them. And, you know, that was my hallelujah moment, <laughs> you know, where I was like, oh my gosh, you know, this is going to change. Mm. Um, so over a period of about two years, I just handed over all of that stuff that was in my good at and don't like quadrant um and in my not good at and don't like quadrant and he took all of that over because that was stuff that he loved and was good at and it was just you know a match made in heaven so mm. made a huge difference for me yeah well, there's, there's some really powerful lessons in that it's a mm -hmm. um, first of all you know put your ego aside secondly yeah. the uh, fact that you don't like doing something it doesn't mean that somebody else may not like doing it so we're all different right. And we all have different preferences. So if you can mm -hmm. find people that love doing things, get them doing those and, and delegate them to them then and give them the resources so that they become good at them if if you know if they're not quite as good as you are. Exactly. Now uh, delegation, I know there's there's quite a lot of um uh 
information on delegation in, in traction itself. So talk to us a little bit about that because I imagine in a big company and based on my experience in the corporate world, the uh, uh, delega- delegation looked more like abdication in a lot of cases. <laughs> right, right. I mean, the key thing there is that you have to delegate things to somebody who gets the thing that you're delegating, wants to do the thing that you're delegating, and has the capacity. So if you're just going to dump stuff on somebody who is going to be equally unhappy doing those things, that's not a good solution. Um, and so in my case, the, the um, scenario that I just described there, the Chris, the person who is my integrator at Whole Brain Group, um, he actually wanted to do the things that I didn't want to do. And so that was just perfect so that over time I, you know, figured out, you know, I didn't just dump it all over on him overnight. Um, But we had a, you know, I think it was about a six to nine month transition plan where I said, okay, here's all of this stuff. I'm going to teach you, you know, five to seven things, you know, every month. And by the time we're, you know, at the end of this time period, you'll know how to do everything. Um, And so just, you know, taking that phased approach, finding the right person to delegate to, and then doing it in the right way so that they're going to be successful at it. Um, Another thing that entrepreneurs tend to do is delegate something, um, like you said, abdicate it to them, and then abandon the person that they've delegated it to. Mm -hmm. And then if the person messes it up, they snatch it back and say, well, see, I can't delegate because you messed it up, right? Um, and so you really you have to make sure that that person is going to be successful and that they've tr- you know got the resources, the training, the knowledge that they need uh, to do that the job that you're delegating to them, so that you don't have to take it back, um, and so that they can you know truly own it moving forward. So there's definitely an art to delegating. Um, it's not as easy as just assigning it to somebody and walking away. Certainly, yeah. but yeah. Um, and there's a tool There's a tool in the EOS toolbox called Delegate and Elevate, which is just a super simple tool that really helps you look at everything that you're doing and putting it, put it into these quadrants so that you can identify the things that you're good at and love doing that will give you energy, you know, down to those things that you're not good at and don't like doing that drain your energy. Um, because those are the things where even if you do an hour of those tasks, it can feel like you worked for eight hours. You know, and so the more time you spend in that upper quadrant, the less it feels like work and the more energy you have. And so that's what the goal is to just work as much of the time in your sweet spot as possible because it's much more enjoyable for everybody. Mm. Yes, and and you wrote a recent blog post about um, hiring a virtual assistant, which is about your current business, right? And it Mm -hmm. talks about the same things. Right. Yeah, making sure, you know, there are things that I'm perfectly capable of doing, but aren't in my sweet spot. And so if I spend an hour scheduling meetings, I just want to, you know, go have a martini at the, at the end of that, and which is not, <laughs> it's not a great recipe for success. Um, but my assistant loves doing that stuff and it, you know, doesn't bother her one bit. So it makes much more sense for her to do those, those tasks than for me to do it. So. Hmm. And also the high value tasks, which are the ones that you are the person that needs to be doing those. There's nobody right. else you that can do those. Away. Yeah, so you need to have exactly. the time to do those rather than mm-hmm. having your time taken by those tasks that are perhaps less valuable in the, the bigger scheme of things or, you know, distracting you from where you add the most value and also exactly. draining your energy, as you said. Mm-hmm. Mm. All right. Now, um, I'm, I love the rocks, the, the, the rocks and the, how the... EOS breaks down 10-year goals, three-year targets, one-year plan, and then rocks. So talk to us a little bit about how that works. <clears throat> yeah, so the, the thing there is just kind of compartmentalizing, right? So, you know, first figuring out what's the, the destination, right? So what's your 10-year target or your long-term goal? Sometimes, you know, it's a seven-year target or whatever, but, you know, what's the thing that you're all working towards so that then you can set the right pace and make sure that everybody is aimed in the same, in the, you know, the same direction. Uh, so getting agreement on what your 10-year target is, and typically that's, you know, some, some kind of um, uh, inspirational goal that gets everybody excited. You know, sometimes it's a revenue goal, sometimes it's, you know, number of clients or whatever impact your company, you know, wants to have on the world. Um, but you want to get everybody on the leadership team on the same page with that. And then from there, you're going to do better short-term planning so you can figure out, okay, if we want to be here in, you know, 2028, you know, where do we want to be in the next three years? What does the company need to look like so that we're making 
incremental progress towards that longer term goal. Uh, and so we get everybody in agreement on the three-year picture so that if they close their eyes and we read the picture out loud, they're all seeing the same thing. Um, mm. And Typically, the, that gets people really uh, energized and excited because they're, again, visualizing the same um, company at the end versus everybody having a different picture in their heads. You know, frequently, it's not that there's not a vision. It's that you don't agree on what the vision is. And so if you can't, if everybody's picturing the same or a, a different thing, then your energy is um, going in different directions. So we want to get everybody picturing the same thing. And then from there, we can do better one-year planning and choose the three to seven goals that we have. What are the most important things we need to get done this year? And then from there, we can do better quarterly planning. So you're just kind of breaking everything up into these bite-sized chunks. Um, and so we, we start to develop a 90-day world where you're just every 90 days, you're picking another three to seven priorities. You're staying laser focused to get those things done, completely done. Um, and then when they're done, you look to the, the list of, of issues or opportunities and decide, okay, what are we going to tackle next and just get back to work. So um, you're creating this cycle of, of execu you know, regular execution um, so that over time you're gaining traction and ultimately you achieve your vision. So hmm. that's pretty yeah. much what it's about. Yeah. So a pretty clear roadmap. Now I'm, I'm interested, I don't recall that the quarterly rocks were kind of themed from quarter to quarter in traction. Is, do, do you work on themes there or do you have uh, another substructure there if you like? Yeah, so not exactly themes, although, you know, in general, the quarterly rocks are going to relate back to the one-year goals. Um, so typically a one-year goal, I don't know, it might be something like, you know, open a new location, right? That's going to take a full year. Um, and so you might have a rock around identifying, you know, what the um, three options are for new locations. And then the next quarter, the rock is to select the location. And then the next quarter, the rock is to, you know, get it built and then the next quarter of the rock is to you know open it whatever that's probably overly aggressive example mm. but um you know the point being that if you have a something that's going to take you 12 months to accomplish you want to break it up into 90 day chunks so that you're continuing to make progress on it so the theme might be around that if you want to use the word theme it's completing that goal of opening the new location um, it is related back but it's not necessarily a you know, the theme is, you know, I don't know, diversity, or, you know, or something yeah, yeah, like that. Yeah. So, okay, you know, again, so, it depends uh, on the company. So, hmm. yeah. And, you know, another example might be, so if you're launching a new product, so before you launch the new product, you've got to do sales. And then before you do sales, you've exactly. got to do, do marketing. So, you know, you might have right. sort of themes based on that as well. Right. And really, again, it's all about predicting. So it's like what's coming next so that you don't say, okay, we're ready to launch the product and, oh, no, we forgot to market it or we don't have a plan for mar marketing. <laughs> yeah. Because as somebody who owns a marketing agency, I can tell you that we frequently had clients coming to us saying, okay, we're ready to market this. And we're saying, you know, well, what, are we you know what are we marketing? What are we marketing? We don't have a plan. We have nothing built. There's no collateral. There's no, you know, branding. So, um, so really it is, it's about getting everybody who, you know, especially those cross-functional types of goals, like you just mentioned, where there's something that, you know, production is doing or operations, you know, marketing has to do something, sales has to do something. You have to all have the um, planes lined up on the runway so that, you know, you're reaching your destination at the same same time. So getting yep. everybody in a room talking about that helps you be more proactive about it so you're not scrambling at the end. Hmm. And, and, of course, that comes back to the accountability part of it where, you know, making sure that people know, what they're accountable for and, and right. when and so on. So so yeah. talk to us a little bit about how that accountability chart works. Yeah. So the, the accountability chart is built first on structure and then on people. So the main thing is to kind of take us, we take a big step back and say where, what is the right structure for this organization in the next, you know, six to 12 months. So a lot of times companies have a structure that, again, was kind of organically grown mm. um, based on the people that they have, and it's not necessarily the right structure to take them to the next level. Um, and so, you know, you want to make sure that you have, um, 
you know, the, the major functions defined, uh, who's responsible for what, what that accountability is, and then you want to make sure you have the right people in those seats who are capable of doing what you need them to do. And again, a lot of times you'll have somebody who kind of got that Peter principle, you know, has been yeah, promoted, yeah. To the, you know, to the, <laughs> their um, level of incompetence. Level of incompetence, <laughs> exactly right. Um, you know, good people, you know, may have been with the company from the very beginning. So you feel a sense of loyalty to them, but they may not be capable of being the CFO when they were hired as the bookkeeper 10 years ago. Mm. You know? um, and so, you know, it's just about, uh, again, about being objective about it, taking a big step back acting as a board of directors that, you know, is making decisions for the good of the company um, and then figuring out what the plan is. You know, you're not going to go back to the office and, you know, fire everybody, um, but you just want to have that vision again of what the right structure is and then slowly, you know, move to get the right people in the right seats who are capable of, you know, helping drive you to your three-year vision, your 10-year target. Um, Because again, a lot of times the people who started with you aren't necessarily qualified to you know, take you to that next level. And you have to be honest about that. Mm. So, um, so that, you know, that's the first step. And then once you have that accountability chart, a lot of it's just about, you know, knowing who to look at when there's an issue or when something is off track or a decision needs to be made. So um, you can say, okay, Fred, you're in charge of sales. You know, why are our sales off and what are you going to do about it? Um, So that you don't get that kind of finger pointing going on somebody who truly owns uh, the results and is driving to achieve them hmm. yeah and and it's really great that sort of building that level of clarity and accountability into the whole system rather than having it kind of as a standalone thing that is a HR system right. but doesn't really integrate with with the entire vision so that hence the system right right exactly right well and, you know with um tying the accountability back to rocks for example you know if there's a priority in launching a product that typically would be owned by the person person who owns product development right and so that it's very clear then who is driving to get that product launched because that person is sitting in that seat on the accountability chart. Um, So it just makes it very easy to figure out who's accountable for what. That doesn't mean they're doing all of the work involved Mm. in that, but they are ultimately driving it and making sure it's getting done and removing obstacles and, you know, raising issues if there's um, a barrier or something standing in the way of achieving it and hopefully removing those obstacles. So again, it just prevents people from stepping on toes, but it also um, prevents having gaps where people are kind of saying, not it, <laughs> you know, well, I thought yeah, you were yeah. doing that. No, I thought you were doing that. And then nobody did it. Right. Mm. So we're always very clear that there's only one person that's accountable. Um, you can't have two people in the same seat accountable because then nobody's accountable. So we're very, we've got some pretty clear mm. rules around those things um, that help reduce complexity for people. So. All right. Well, Thanks for giving us such a clear outline of the entrepreneurial operating system and how it all hangs together. It's been really fascinating, and and I certainly encourage people to, um, first of all, read the book Traction, which I can highly recommend, um, and also Get a Grip. I have had a look at Get a Grip, um, but I will get that and read that. And, And the other books you mentioned, Rocket Fuel, How to Be a Great Boss, and what the heck is EOS? So <laughs> I really encourage everybody to explore those. That's my those. favorite title. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I guess if, if you hadn't heard of it and hadn't read Traction, then that, that's an appropriate question. <laughs> hmm. So, yeah, I'd like to move on to the buzz, which is our innovation round, and it's designed to help our audience who are primarily innovators and leaders in their field with some tips from your experience. So, I imagine that some of this is going to be, or probably a lot of it is going to be based on EOS, but which is where your experience is anyway. (laughs) Um, So there's a series of five questions and hopefully you'll give us some insightful answers that will inspire people to go and do something awesome. So first question is, uh, what's the number one thing you think anyone needs to do to be more innovative? (laughs) So I will give you an EOS answer here. Um, (laughs) So, you know, the discipline that we encourage our leadership teams to um, embrace is something called a clarity break, which is just 
taking time for yourself with your devices turned off. You know, mm-hmm. Gino says, go sit in a Starbucks somewhere with a legal pad um, and turn your phone off and just give your brain a chance to think. Um, you know, so especially in today's world with, you know, interruptions constantly from, you know, email and texts and all kinds of stuff, there's just not that much time that we all take to just think. Uh, and so we do encourage our teams to take, you know, ideally a weekly clarity break, although not everybody, you know, does that. Um, but weekly, bi-weekly, quarter, something regular so that you're taking, you know, three to four hours um, for yourself and just allowing yourself to let your brain go where it, it may go. And, mm. you know, most people who embrace that discipline and say that that's just critical to, um, coming up with those, those good ideas, those new fresh perspectives, um, you know, that they can't, they're just too close to it on a daily basis when you're rushing from thing to thing to thing. So that's what I would encourage people to do is just truly turn your, <laughs> turn your brain off now and then and let the ideas flow and you'll be amazed at what comes out. Hmm. Great advice. Yeah. I find that um, when I, I exercise most mornings, I go out and ride my bike and I find that particularly if I'm on my own, I, I tend to go into that space and have a lot of ideas there. And I'm sure that I know that some of the guests I've spoken to um, have other forms of exercise that they love doing and do regularly. And that, that, that's where they often get ideas. So it's the Absolutely. same same principle, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, except it's a little hard to write down your ideas if you're on your bike. But that's right. Yeah, or some, as long as you have a pad of paper when you get back, or a <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, do some a voice people, memo on your phone. Some people do voice memos. Yeah, yeah. I find Sorry, yeah. I find myself <laughs> reciting the things. There's sometimes I I just count and I say, oh, okay, I've got five ideas, and then, right. and if I <laughs> recite them, if I recite them a few times and then remember the number five, usually they'll come back to me. When exactly. I get, to, exactly. get to the pen and paper at home. Mm-hmm. All right. What's the best thing you've done to develop new ideas then? Well, I think along those lines, um, setting aside time for exercise is key for me. Hmm. Uh, When I don't do that, I, you know, I tend to say, oh, I don't have time for that. But really, when I make the time, it just gives me more energy throughout the day. And so I really try not to slip out of that, um, that habit, because it actually is kind of a self-fulfilling, you know, if you don't exercise, you feel more tired than you're, you're too tired to exercise and, you know, blah, 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 <laughs> yeah. blah, right? Um, and so the more energy I have, the more innovative I am, the more um, interested I am in trying new things. And if I'm too tired, then I'm like, eh, I don't have time for that anyways, you know? Um, so for me, exercise and then sleep is the other piece of it, um, which now that my kids are older, certainly easier to, <laughs> to get a good mm-hmm. night's sleep. Um, but similarly, you know, I have a, as a workaholic type personality, it's very easy to say, oh, I'm just going to stay up a little longer, or get up a little earlier and do one more thing and one more thing and one more thing. But then you're just burning yourself out, you know, so you have to take that time to, to regroup and rejuvenate um, because you'll actually be more productive <laughs> in a shorter period of time than if you constantly push yourself to your limits. So um, that's something that was hard to learn took me about 45 years to, to figure that out. But. Yeah. Yeah. And burnout is, is such a huge risk and so common in, in the entrepreneurial space. And Absolutely. Uh, and I think that's great advice that looking after yourself, whatever form that takes, but definitely, you know, looking after your body and your well-being and your energy levels and your health is, is critical. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, you know, just to give a shout out to Anise Kavanaugh, who, you know, you mentioned at the beginning of the podcast, I went to one of her workshops about, you know, intentional energetic presence several years ago. And that really is one of the things that opened up my eyes to, you know, the importance of self care and what an impact on your energy that you have for yourself, but also what you're projecting to the people around you Mm. um, and what that does in terms of um, what people are receiving. That made a huge difference in, in my life. So all right. Now, I think I know the answer to the next question, but I'll ask it anyway. Um, what's your favorite system or tool for improving your productivity and allowing you to be more innovative? Yeah, I'll have to say EOS again. Yeah. Um, no, I, you know, it just the more, you know, again, I've been doing this for several years now, and I'm still just continually um, 
excited by the impact that I see it have on my own company, on my clients. Um, you know, just so much energy in many companies is spent kind of reinventing the wheel. Um, and what EOS does is gives you tools to do the common things that everybody needs to do in their business. So you don't have to spend your time <laughs> inventing yeah. those things, you know. And so if you just follow the process, follow the system, um, it's just much more efficient and reduces complexity and frees up your time and energy to spend on the things that make you and your company unique. Um, and I've, you know, clearly drunk the Kool-Aid, mm. uh, but, but it really, you know, I just see it over and over and over again with the companies that I work, work with. And so it just keeps proving itself to me. So. Okay. Well, thanks for that answer. And, and, you yeah. know, we have been talking about the EOS for yeah. Sorry to say most again. of the episode, so <laughs> yeah. uh, it's not surprising. <laughs> Right, right. And and the next uh, question probably has a similar answer, although I imagine it will be part of EOS. So what's the best way to keep a project or a client on track? Uh, you know, the biggest thing, and I'll, I'll go back to my marketing days for this, is that um, really making sure that you're regularly checking in and that you're continually making sure that you're on the same page. And so this is true in EOS land, but it was also true when I, we were servicing clients, you know, as a marketing agency, it is so easy to start to, to drift off of what the original agreement was, you know, because you get excited about something. Hmm. So just losing focus and losing, um, you know, getting that alignment kind of drifting away from one another can result in so much wasted time and energy. And so if you're, more regularly checking in and making sure, yep, we're still on track, yep, we're still on the same page, you're going to save yourself a lot of time in the long run. So uh, I think people avoid having meetings and conversations because they think they waste time. Um, but in my experience, it's actually a great time management tool to have that regular check-in where you're you know, just continuing to, to confirm that you're on the same page so you don't waste time going off in different directions. So yeah, that's my big yeah. Okay, that's that's great advice. And I was speaking to somebody yesterday that um, I don't remember whether it was this question or one of the others, but there was a comment made that just pick up the phone. You know, you can actually make yes. calls. You can actually make calls with those little um, handheld devices that you use to check Facebook and so on. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> All right. Um, so, what's the number one thing anyone can do to differentiate themselves? So this, this is a tougher one for me to answer. You know, each one of the companies that I've worked with, both in, you know, the marketing world and in my EOS practice, um, has very different things that differentiate them. And so, you know, in, in the EOS system, we talk about your three uniques and what are the three things that set you apart when, you know, taken in combination with one another, right? So maybe, you know, you're not the only one who has... Um, an expert team and you're not the only one who has affordable prices, you know, whatever, but those, the three things together make you stand out from, from your competition. Um, so really, I think for me, it's just making sure that you are clear on what it is that makes you different and that everybody on your team agrees so that you can be consistent about what you're communicating mm. to your prospects and to your clients. Um, and also asking them, what it is, why do they work with you? What is it that makes them come back to you time and time again? Because sometimes what you perceive to be your differentiator is actually not what your clients perceive um, as the most important thing. So, you know, taking all of that input and then, again, getting clear on what those things are and just being consistent about communicating that and delivering on it. You know, it's not just a marketing thing, but it's also a delivery. Um, you, know, you want to promise and deliver on your promise of what makes you different. So those are I think, you know, saying what makes you different and then actually yeah. walking the walk yeah, yeah. is what makes you different. Yeah. Because, you know, many companies promise things and then don't deliver on it, you know. Mm. And so if you can actually promise it and deliver on it, that sets you apart pretty much from <laughs> yeah. out of the gate. Which is a bit sad, but <laughs> it's a great it's opportunity, true. isn't yeah. it? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, it is true. And, yeah, yeah that's great advice. And I, I love that you said also, you know, ask clients because often – um, people will value things that you you perhaps take for granted or are not as aware of that 
that particular thing sets you apart from others in, in the eyes of clients. Exactly. Hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks for getting us through the buzz, Marissa. And what's the future now for you and, and for the business of EOS? So for me, um, you know, all I'm focused on right now is just being the best EOS implementer I can be. So I did start my practice while I still was in the day-to-day day of my company, and then I was also in the role um, of marketing director at EOS Worldwide for four years as well. Uh, so I kind of pl- wore multiple hats for a number of years, and mm. just in the last three months, I've finally um, divested myself of all of those other hats, and I'm fully <laughs> wearing the EOS implementer hat. Um, and so I'm just really excited about focusing all of my time and energy just on helping my EOS clients achieve their own visions and get what they want from their businesses and, um, you know, just be the best, be the best implementer that I can be. So I'm not trying to take over the world or anything, but <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> makes All me happy right. when my clients are happy. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, that's a big driver for a lot of us. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's a huge buzz and I'm sure it's, it must be a huge buzz for you when you see the turnaround in the companies that you work with. So, oh, absolutely. Yeah. Mm. yeah. And, you know, honestly, and just to talk about EOS worldwide as well, it's really neat to see the momentum that the EOS community is um, experiencing right now as well. So, you know, since I joined the community, there was about 80 professional implementers back then, and now there's over 215 out in the world. We're in, mm. I think, 10 or 11 countries um, and so it's just really neat to see uh, EOS, you know, being translated into different languages and, you know, more and more implementers coming to be trained um, from all over the world. Um, there's actually an implementer in Australia, Daniel Davis, who's developing a community of implementers in the Asia Pacific re- region. Um, and he has a, you know, kind of a little um, community building on that side of the world, which is really neat to see. So it's just really cool to, to see it you know, gain traction, excuse the pun, um, mm-hmm. in the time that I've been involved in the, in the company and just to see the impact that it can have then on, you know, even more, more entrepreneurs and leadership teams. So, All right. Um, so what's the number one piece of advice you'd give it to any business owner who wants to be a leader in their field and in innovation and productivity? Now, the number one piece of advice I always give people is don't be afraid to ask for help. Um, so many business owners I know just carry the weight of the world <laughs> on their shoulders mm-hmm. um, and they just feel like they started the company, they're the leader, they have to know all the answers and make all the decisions and take all the responsibility. And while certainly, you know, the buck stops with them, um, there are lots, typically lots of other people in their company who care and who want to help and uh, would love to be a part of, of something bigger. Um, but you just have to, again, let go of your ego <laughs> a little bit um, and be vulnerable and say, you know, gosh, I don't know the answer. You know, what do you think? Um, mm. And it's amazing what you'll get back when you just let your guard down sometimes and just are open and honest and, um, you know, put it out there and accept the help that's given to you. So that's, I think, makes you a better leader when you're collaborating with others and you're working as a team and you have other ideas coming in to to solve the issues that you have and that will lead you to the better solution so mm, yeah that's <clears throat> that's great advice and it comes back a little bit to what you said earlier about you know there's people within your organization or they might be outside your organization who you know have strengths and capabilities and who enjoy doing things that you may not enjoy doing or you may not have strengths or capabilities in so reaching out to them and and bringing them on board asking for help Mm -hmm. and you know there's only so many issues in business right so I see a lot of the same issues over and over again but the people experiencing them think that they're the only ones who have ever had these issues right and so you know they just sometimes there's shame there you know they they don't want to admit that they don't know how to solve something and once they open up and ask for help you know you can it's amazing how much more quickly you can get to a solution. There's mm. no need to suffer, you know, suffer alone and in silence. Um, you know, people want to help you and, and want to see you succeed. So, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Ask for help. Great. 
Thanks for this, Marissa. It's been really great. I've enjoyed this immensely and I'm sure um, uh, the audience will get a lot of value out of this. So where can people reach out and say thank you? Uh, let's see. So I am on Twitter as Marissa, M-A-R-I-S-A underscore Smith, S-M-I-T-H one, because there was already another Marissa Smith without a one. <laughs> uh, so I'm on Twitter. I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, my website is 87 plus P-L-U-S dot com. You can find me oh. there. All right. And we'll post links to all of that in the show notes oh. underneath the episode so people can just click through. Now, finally, who would you like me to interview on a future Nova Buzz podcast and oh. why? Well, if you haven't talked to Daniel Davis, I would definitely recommend Daniel. Um, okay. Like I said, he's kind of championing the EOS community in Australia. Uh, so he's in your time zone, which would certainly be yeah. helpful for you probably. <laughs> um, but he's got a, a, a number of implementers that he is um, training and mentoring to grow their own practices in the area. And he's working with you know, a number of, of local businesses to help them implement EOS. And so he would probably be a really great, um, great interview. So. All right. Well, Daniel. Unless you're tired well, of hearing about EOS, but <laughs> I'm sure he'd no, bring not a at all. Yeah. So. Yeah. All right. So Daniel will reach out to you um, and yeah. invite you to the podcast courtesy of Marissa Smith. So thanks so much for sharing your time and your insights with us so generously today, Marissa. I've really enjoyed it. And, My pleasure. And thanks for having me. I'm sure that for those people that haven't or weren't familiar with EOS before, that that would have piqued their interest, and I hope it at least gets them looking at your websites and reading the book. Um, but I'm sure that those of us that do know a little bit about it have also gained a lot from this interview. So I wish you all the best for the future, and let's keep in touch. Great. Thank you so much. Thanks. All right. Great. Thanks. That was Good. great. Yeah. So hopefully the sound was okay. I was hearing a little bit of feedback on my end, but I didn't want to mess around with the settings while I was talking and screw anything yeah. up. So hopefully yeah, there are, a, there are a couple of times where it just like one or two times you dropped out for about a second. Okay. But, you know, it was just enough that I said, I won't say anything, you know, and I keep my fingers crossed. Right. So I don't think it'll be a problem. And there were one or two times where okay. there was just a little bit of, you know, that kind of weird noise. Yeah. Uh, but I think, you know, I don't think there's anything we need to edit out and okay. I don't, don't think we'll lose meaning on anything. It was maybe just one or two words every now and then. Great. Mm. All right. How did you find the interview? Perfect. No, that was great. You did... A very nice job of making it feel conversational, and hopefully I did a good job of not sounding too uh, too much of a EOS evangelist there. So, <laughs> Well, yeah, that's, I mean, that's, not, that's what it was about, yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah. No, I really enjoyed it. Um, Great. And I'm going to have to um, read read the other books. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, we, we um, kind of have a system like that in place. I mean, I've, I've mm -hmm. you know cobbled together my own I'm, I'm a very strong process person like you right. I was when I, I I didn't have dreams of going into business as a young kid but I did play with um cards you know I had had um I loved putting together what do they call them the like library cards and stuff and and just oh. have things organized and structured mm -hmm. and you yep. know so yeah you know, I saved up for a label maker very yeah, early on yeah, yeah. So and um, yeah. yeah, and then uh, of course my background is in science, so there's sort of the whole scientific method and structure and mm -hmm. process and writing, you know, writing down experiments before you do them and that right. kind of thing. So mm -hmm. you know that that's all in my psyche. But we've sort of implemented a lot of the planning and the vision stuff from traction, you know, in in some form, not probably right. as as strict mm -hmm. as as the system. Um, itself yeah. would would it's, prescribe but right. yeah the yeah there's definitely there. you know timeless principles in the yeah. system right so it's yeah. not necessarily something that nobody had ever thought of before but to me it's the way he put it all together mm. into one system so that you you know yeah i think I, that's the beauty of it that's what i really liked about right. you know right. the book that you know everything kind of fits in seamlessly so there's not right. all these different pillars that mm -hmm. um 
look as though they're dis- that they are actually integrated, but they look as though they're disconnected, and so then not everybody's on the same page because there's people in the I don't know HR silo or in the marketing silo right. or the sales silo, and and right. kind of it doesn't all fit together uniquely. So right. that that's what I think the beauty of it is. Yep. All right. Well, thanks very much Thank again. You. And My pleasure. Um, now we've got a whole bunch of. Um, interviews already lined up so this may be early to mid-August even before sure, no we worries. publish this one but we'll definitely let you know when Great. it's published and um, yeah. And do you would you like me to introduce you to? That would be great yeah to Daniel. Daniel? Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. All right so what I'll do is I'll introduce you to him and then I'll copy Fran who is his integrator. Um, so she's the wrangler of all details in that business. <laughs> <Okay>. uh, <laughs> so um, she'll probably, you know, be the one to respond and get the two of you uh, hooked up. So Okay, excellent. Thanks a lot, Marissa. Yeah, my pleasure. My pleasure. All right. Great. Yeah. Well, it's very nice to meet you. And if there's anything that when you listen to the interview, you are, you know, wasn't clear, or if you need a link to something or whatever, just let me know and I'm happy to get that back to you. All right. I will do. Thanks. Great. All right. Well, have a great rest of your day then. Yeah. Enjoy the rest of your day too. Thank you. All right. Take care. Bye. Bye. That was another fascinating interview with a first-hand look at how an expert helps businesses implement the entrepreneurial operating system. All the ideas and tips that Marissa shared with us can be found at innovabiz.co forward slash Marissa Smith. That is M-A-R-I-S-A-S-M-I-T-H. All lowercase, all one word, innovabiz.co forward slash Marissa Smith. You'll also find contact information for getting in touch with Marissa there. Marissa suggested I interview Daniel Davis, an EOS implementer who's based in Australia on a future InnovaBuzz podcast. So we're in the same time zone, so that's got to work really well for us. So Daniel, keep an eye on your inbox for an invitation from us to the InnovaBuzz podcast, courtesy of Marissa Smith. Stay connected. Head on over to iTunes or Stitcher or Pocket Casts and subscribe to the InnovaBuzz podcast so you make sure you'll never miss another episode. We'd also love you to leave us a review because what you think matters. Take some of the ideas you've heard today and apply them in your business. Any thoughts, ideas, suggestions or questions, share them in the comments below the blog post. And remember, if you want to get better marketing results than you ever have, join our fantastic LinkedIn community at the Transformational Marketing Academy. All you have to do is go to innovabiz.co forward slash tmac. It's free to join. Hope to see you there soon. Until next time, I'm Jürgen Strauss from Innovabiz. Remember to be awesome and keep innovating. <laughs>